This is the uh, geodesic dome for ASM International. This facility was completed in 1959. It was built on farmland donated by our uh, secretary of the, the society, William Hunt Eisenman. They had a vision uh, that was realized by this facility back in the late 50s, and it still reads as a very modern building today. This is a geodesic dome made out of aluminum alloy. It's 11 miles of aluminum alloy extrusions. It's a concept by Buckminster Fuller, who came up with the concept of a geodesic dome, and this particular one was designed by T.C. Howard. The structure goes as deep as 70 feet into the ground to support the dome. The dome is a very efficient engineering structure. If you want to cover a very large area with a very minimum amount of material, the shape is a sphere. That's the minimum amount of surface area to cover an area. And to have a sphere with these 56,000 different pieces, you see the structure itself is a repeating hexagonal patterns. For materials engineers like myself and uh, many of our members, structure is represented by these types of models. So not only is this an efficient engineering structure, but it's a great symbol for our society in that it uh, also uh, models how we're working with the structure of materials and how that affects the properties and how you can manipulate the structure to get the properties that you want. ASM was American Society of Metals back in the mid-50s. That's what the AS and M originally stood for. So within the garden here, there are 66 different minerals that are important for manufacture of metal materials. This is two types of different iron oxide. It's an ore that you would use for making iron and steels. This fountain was created in 2000. Eric Orr's last monument that he made, or last sculpture that he made, is called ASM Singularity and represented in this fountain are a stainless steel around the different layers of the fountain. There's another fountain in the back of the grounds. It was a, a tribute to William Hunt Eisenman and his favorite saying was make no small plans. So when they made the plans and decided to make ASM headquarters out here, they weren't making small plans and they, today it still looks uh, like a very modern and interesting facility. Still captures the imagination of the people this is our uh, lobby to the building. Back when this building was designed, the uh, open feel was in vogue. There's a couple of features in this room i like to point out that was original, is that you see these lights along the ceiling. You can see how it reflects into the dome space and around the circle of, this, of the structure. So you'll also see some of these panels uh, throughout. These panels were commissioned in 1953, and they're by an artist called Nikos Beljan. Uh, he's got an interesting technique where he's done abrasion on aluminum panels and the uh, series is called The History of Iron. They tried to feature metals in an interesting way, so this hanging stainless steel staircase, the brass uh, ha handrails, that was intentional examples of, of uh, innovative use of metal. So this is our education lobby and this uh, wall of panels and based on the size of those panels, is, uh, it, it represents the contribution that, uh, that was made. Uh, so there's a lot, we're, we're fortunate to have uh, some, some interesting companies that are uh, supporting uh, uh, labs and testing and material science. Uh, appreciate the, our education program here at ASM. So we're going to uh, go into a heat treat lab where solar manufacturing has donated a vacuum furnace. We'll go into a microscopy lab uh, where Zeiss has enabled us to have several research grade microscopes and an electron microscope. Bueller and Instron are our sister companies, and Instron is heavily invested in providing equipment for the mechanical testing lab, and Bueller manufactures and represents some hardness testing that's in the mechanical testing lab, and Bueller manufactures a lot of equipment that is uh, for metallographic preparation. So this is a teaching lab for metallography. We have uh, Allied High Tech polisher grinders, Bueller polisher grinders, Lico polisher grinders as, as some of their main features. Uh, and we have some uh, uh, mounting presses and some vibratory polishers in this room. In this corner, three uh, or four pieces of uh, analytical equipment for chemical analysis. Uh, the reason it's here is that my fume hoods are here and these things generate some fumes that you have to get out of the buildings. Chemical analysis is the way you uh, test to show that you have uh, created the proper alloy chemically. So that was an ON8 measuring oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen levels. This unit over here is another LECO designed and set up to measure carbon and sulfur. 
that you need to know very accurately and you need special equipment to do it. So this is a mass spec by uh, mass properties and often uh, you would be dissolving uh, alloys in an acid and some of the acids are very nasty, uh, uh, hydrofluoric acid and things like that and, and then you would uh, sort them based on how much of different weights of different ions. So that's the basics of mass spec. And metallography is a preparation technique so that we can reveal the structure of the, of the materials. So in this lab, you have to go through a very gentle preparation technique where you uh, section it to get the size that you need, the actual area you want to examine. And then you have to slowly remove material with progressively finer grits of uh, media. So you do some fixed grinding initially uh, with silicon carbide or diamond. And you would go down to finer and finer uh, grit sizes. Then finally you polish and you want to have a real uh, flat surface with low damage, and then you would etch it chemically in the, in the fume hoods to reveal the, the structure that, that's there. So it's called the, the microstructure. We come into our uh, microscopy lab, and this is a, a teaching lab. It's kind of a nice that we have our students right in the middle of the equipment that we would be uh, using to analyze their samples. So, so the purpose of that microscopy lab is to provide a, a flat, damage-free, surface that has the right contrast to capture the, the structure in, in, in this lab. So we're surrounded by uh, some microscopes that are, are good at doing it. This over here is a uh, electron microscope. It's a nice extra capability because all of these light microscopes, around a thousand X is the highest magnification you can get. And you have to have a very well prepared flat sample. But if you need to look at a rough sample like a fracture or a failure, then you, then you need something that has a, a more of a depth of field. Depth of field being everything that's in focus at different heights at the same time. And if you use electrons instead of light, uh, that's one way to get some very detailed uh, um, images of those, of, of those rougher surfaces. On the uh, edge of the uh, electron microscope is an EDS detector. And when you're impacting uh, a sample with electrons, uh, X-rays are given off as the electrons uh, get bounced out of their orbitals. And, and so if each element has a characteristic signature of those X-rays that are uh, given off, uh, due to the interva interaction of the electron beam with the material. If you can detect those and plot them, then you can do chemical analysis uh, in, a, in, a, in a scope and you can have some very, uh, very nice uh, capability. So we limit our class size to uh, about nine students in here so that, that they were able to, uh, to actually get a lot of hands-on time. And we design most of our lab classes 50% lecture and 50% hands-on time. So you actually get in and use a lot of different equipment uh, if you take one of our courses here. This is a uh, microscope. This is a microscope that next year will be 100 years old. Uh, this was donated uh, by the Milwaukee Electric Company, and it was about 50 years ago that this piece of equipment, and we kind of rediscovered the pieces and got them back together uh, during our renovations. And uh, it's kind of interesting that the, the optics hasn't changed. All of those microscopes in there have these same features of a light source. Their light source isn't a carbon rod and an open arc the way this one is, <coughs> and it has uh, using uh, glass, uh, using objectives and eyepieces to, uh, to image and then cameras is all still happening today in a, in a much more sophisticated manner. Uh, this is a mechanical testing lab and here we, uh, we basically apply loads or forces uh, to materials and then monitor their behavior. So, so this is a tensile tester where we're either going to be stretching uh, metals or compressing and mashing metals and most of the time we're we're stretching them. It's set up now with certain grips here. So this is set up to, uh, to pull apart uh, flats samples. So we want to we want to really understand what's happening in the sample so there's often a gauge length or a reduced section of the sample and then we're going to uh, pull this apart at a controlled rate of loading. So this is a test frame, a cross head, this is a uh, load cell to measure the, the loads that you uh, achieve during the pooling. And this is a video extensometer, which is one nice non-contact way to measure the stretching. So you can see here, we kind of painted some dots on here. This camera and, and the LED lighting uh, lets you uh, identify those, those dots and then measure while they're pulling apart. So design engineers and all of us need to know 
uh, when things are going to break and when things are going to bend, how far can you pull it before it breaks. This is an electropulse. It's a cyclic loading machine. Um, it's got an electrolinear motor up here, so you're able to change the shape of the, uh, of the loading. You can have triangular loading, sign loading. You can model loading that you measure from a car or an airplane and model it here uh, type of thing. So this can uh, vibrate or, or load uh, axially up to hundreds of hertz, but it also can do torsional. So this load cell here can measure torsional and axial loading. You, you can do uh, some testing that can give you fatigue life and uh, you can do fracture mechanics testing on here. So this is expensive. If I wanted to, to pay someone to machine this and give me results from it, it's probably $80 to $100 for each one of these samples. There was a real need to uh, come up with a test that, that lets you know things are all right, they're heat treated properly, and, and that test was hardness testing where you put a dent and either measure how deep the dent is or you're measuring the size of the indentation with a controlled indenter and controlled loading conditions. So like this is a Rockwell test. It, would, it has a diamond cone as the indenter. This is a test block where you would, you would have a known value so that if I test that test block, the right way and the machine's working, I would get the hardnesses of that test block. Uh, so, the, so it's a very, this Rockwell test is a very sensitive test for measuring distance. And then we go to the micro hardness testing, and that's what this is. We have ability to have a sample, and it, it turns out that the sample is a lot like those metallographic samples. It's gotta be very flat, and it has to have really good contrast, and as polished sample works very well with, uh, with micro hardness testing especially now that things are automated. And this is a micro hardness tester that is very manual. You measure in the eyepiece the shape of the dimensions and normally one or two diagonals. And then you bring, it, you bring it down and then you have to dwell for 10 seconds or so. So every indentation takes about 20 to 30 seconds. So now that you have automation of a fully motorized stage, a camera that measures the indentation, and a, a stage that can lay down predefined patterns, you can do hundreds of indentations. So this is our heat treat lab. Before 2013, we basically had some uh, box furnaces to do different temperatures. These can do up to 1100 degree temperatures. This is a, a, a taco induction hardener. And if you, if you put a sample in here and you reverse the current back and forth rapidly, you can generate some heat on the surface of the part. Uh, we had some pretty basic heat treat capabilities until 2013 when solar atmospheres, so they designed and donated this vacuum furnace uh, in honor of the 100th anniversary. It's got some nice capabilities and now we have atmosphere capability. All of these heat treatments, uh, if you just have them in an uncontrolled atmosphere, the, the, the materials can interact with the uh, gases in the atmosphere, the oxygen in particular. Uh, but if you can control it with, uh, with the partial pressure of argon or nitrogen or uh, high vacuum, you don't have any of those oxygen molecules to interact and, and cause uh, decarburization or oxidation of the surface. So having a nice controlled atmosphere and very tight controls of ramps and holds uh, really enables you to do some different things with, with heat treatment. We have it hooked up to a liquid tank of argon. Uh, we're uh, applying about 100 PSI to control the uh, valves to backfill. And then when we quench uh, or cool down from that, after that hold, we're going to get the argon in there as quick as we can. And on the back there, there's a fan that's going to be rotating the argon through the furnace and through a heat exchanger to do the cooling. So let me show you, this is a really old hardness tester. So you saw the hardness testers in the other room. Those are maybe 10 years old. This is probably 50 or 60 years old. So, uh, and this one you don't have to plug in. You, uh, you just uh, do the hardness test and you read it off, right off the dial. This is a Rockwell hardness tester. So when we're manipulating these uh, thermal histories, we're trying to uh, establish a certain range of hardness or, or, or certain mechanical properties. And, but what we're really doing is changing the structure in a way, and our metallography lab is the way we would reveal that structure. So the labs are all kind of real basic uh, materials processing, uh, but they all work together to get the materials to the property levels that you want. In addition to adding the chemical analysis that we've done this year, 
We've uh, added a uh, computer tomography lab and a powder characterization lab. Parker had a, a big uh, part of that. Nikon has uh, partially donated and Parker has partially funded this commuter tomography uh, unit that we'll see in the next lab. And it's almost a million dollar unit. So it's uh, the, 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 the capability of, of our corporate partnerships and uh, manufacturing partnerships and their uh, appreciation of working with ASM uh, has, has enabled some real nice capabilities. So this next lab is the computer tomography lab. Out of manufacturing is kind of an exploding technology, but we've been very careful and very fortunate to uh, add capabilities that also accentuate our, our main programming. So th this is a, a CT scanner. Uh, CT stands for computer tomography. And uh, we have a, a, a source for x-rays. And this source for x-rays has a little filament like that. So we, we, it has uh, leads and you run uh, uh, resi uh, current through this filament and it gives off electrons. Then you accelerate those electrons to hit a target. There's a tungsten uh, target right here. When it hits the target, it's knocking electrons out of the atoms. The atoms fall back in and give off x-rays. That panel in the back is a detector. Uh, 2,000 by 2,000 uh, different pixels. They're 0.2 millimeter round pixels that detect the energy of the x-rays. So we're able to use the CT scanner has the resolution to, uh, to look at powders and the penetrating capability to look at some parts. Uh, you capture the images over here, but you need a lot of horsepower to create these volumes and query them. And, uh, and that's what this, this is a con reconstruction computer. So taking the data from a CT scanner and uh, creating it something useful. This is a uh, Snickers bar. A CT of a Snickers bar. And when you, get, when you do the reconstruction of the volume, I can see much more detail than in one uh, image of, uh, of, of the x-ray. This is a uh, confocal microscope, and it's using laser, cycling laser, to get very accurate height measurements. I do kind of feature this a little bit. It's almost part of the building tour, but uh, this is one of those five supports for the dome. And it comes down into a, a little garden area with a fountain here. So it, we're actually underneath the grass roof. And if, if you have windows over here and this courtyard here, it doesn't feel like you're in a ground, a ground floor or, or a, a lower level. So this is the powder characterization lab. It's basically a clean room. But it's a clean room with the pressure set up so that we're not wanting the powder to contaminate the rest of the building. We're, this is not really an industrial shop where we're doing manufacturing. And the powders are small enough and have enough uh, potential health of effects that we want to control that and keep everyone safe. So this is basically an airlock. So we would go in and gown and, and uh, put on our respirators to go actually do the testing. So the, the properties of powder changes with the humidity and temperature. So this is a controlled temperature and humidity environment. Uh, we're, we're in here, we have a couple of HEPA fume hoods. The entire room is filtered and uh, the, the, the air is rotated and filtered uh, 20 times an hour. Camsizer X2, you stream a powder dry past a couple of cam high-speed cameras and you're able to measure the shape and size distribution of millions of powder particles. Uh, inside the fume hood, because it's a little bit dirtier application, is a rheometer. So the way the powder behaves under load or with air blowing through it or at different speeds of movement are all things you would like to measure uh, and understand if you're trying to feed powder or control the flow of powder in a machine.